Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first week of our 2022 Camp Prosperity series. We'll give people maybe one or two minutes to continue to log in, and then we'll get started shortly. Thank you again. So hello and welcome to Camp Prosperity, the new change agent, federal, state, and local advocacy in an election year. Just to go over a few housekeeping um, notes that we want you to keep in mind, please feel free to get cozy, join from a um, join from a quiet place. This webinar will be recorded and mailed to registrants within a week. Um, and all webinar attendees are muted to ensure sound quality, but feel free to use our questions box and the chat to give us comments anytime so that you're heard and that you're able to feel like you are engaging um, us and the different speakers um, for this webinar. Also, if you experience any technical issues, please email gotomeeting at prosperitynow.org. And again, we want you to get cozy, get comfortable and to join from a quiet space. Also feel free to grab a snack, um, a coffee. We wanna ensure that you're fully comfortable and enjoying today's webinar and taking everything in. Also, please talk to us, engage us, um, use the questions box and, and feel free to leave comments at any time and also use social media. Um, feel free to send us anything and also ask any questions on Twitter and using the hashtag Camp Prosperity, and also reflect on ways to apply what you learned today. So um, now's the time to really listen in and confirm those, those unique fundamental beliefs that you've always held, or even challenge your thinking and undergo some paradigm shifts. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. And without further ado, I will now introduce Vanna Cure. Great, thank you so much, Olivia. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Camp Prosperity 2022. I'm Vanna Cure, Associate Director for Advocacy here at Prosperity Now, but also your lead camp counselor for Camp Prosperity. Um, as some of you might know, this is our fifth year hosting Camp Prosperity at Prosperity Now, uh, and we really designed this series to help build the advocacy skills of our network of state-based advocacy organizations and to connect our network of advocates to one another, uh, to share success stories, to share advocacy challenges, um, and then also ask questions related to advocacy. Uh, this week's webinar, as you'll see on the next screen here, is the new change agent, uh, federal, state, and local advocacy in an election year. Uh, today, we'll focus on how nonprofits can engage in, election, in an election year, uh, how to navigate the different pathways to advocacy, and how legislators, agencies, and other uh, stakeholders can work together to bring about systemic change. And really just want to talk about what's working in advocacy. I know that's a question that we get a lot here at Prosperity Now. How are people having successes with their various campaigns? You know, what are some things that are really working right now? So that's what we hope to cover um, in our webinar today. And you can see there sort of what we have coming up over the uh, next three weeks. I've already told you what today's webinar will focus on. Uh, next week is our permission to engage session where we'll, where we'll talk about how to equip ambassadors to advocate. So how to get clients involved in your advocacy work, how to get the board bought into your advocacy work. And then on week three, July 26, I hope you all will join us for that as well, where we will talk about uh, equity to justice. So how to go from equity is just a buzzword to more actionable solutions and uh, how we measure equity in both policy and programs. So I hope that you all will join us for all three parts of this wonderful series. On the next slide, as, as Olivia mentioned earlier, we want you all to engage. We always like to try to make uh, Camp Prosperity feel as interactive as possible for a virtual series. Um, so it's, to achieve that, we've included several ways for you all to engage with us and win prizes throughout the series. Uh, during each session, we'll award a prize to the top tweeter. Uh, so please, if you have uh, if you have Twitter, 
uh, please like, tweet, and use the hashtag that you see on your screen there, Camp Prosperity, so that we can easily find your tweets. Um, and use Twitter to share quotes that you're hearing, hearing from speakers on the webinar, uh, or you can use it to ask questions or just retweet, retweet uh, Prosperity Now. But please uh, use Twitter, engage us on Twitter, um, and you may be one of our lucky winners. Uh, we'll also do a pop quiz at the end of today's session. If you all have joined us for previous Camp Prosperity uh, series, you know about our pop quizzes. People tend to really enjoy those. Uh, so towards the end of today's session, we'll ask the question of pop quiz and the first person to type the answer into the chat box will win a small prize from Prosperity Now. Uh, so be sure to stick around for that. And then lastly, um, if you complete our post webinar survey, you'll be entered to, to win a small prize from Prosperity Now as well. So I uh, want to move us along and introduce you to today's wonderful speakers that I am so excited to hear from today. Uh, Natalie, joining us today is Natalie Ossenfort, who serves as the interim director uh, for the Boulder, Ana excuse me, Boulder Advocacy Initiative at the Alliance for Justice. Yumhi Park, who is the director of marketing and campaigns for Prosperity Now. Harish Patel, who is the founder and director of Economic Security for Illinois. And Sabrina De Santiago, who is the policy and research director for Golden State Opportunity. Uh, we're so excited to hear from these four speakers today, excited that they could lend their expertise uh, to this to talk election year advocacy, and we'll hear from them in just a few minutes. Before I turn it over to uh, Natalie, I want to go over our agenda really quickly. In just a moment, I'll do a poll question for you all to get a sense of who's on the call, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Natalie to discuss election year advocacy for nonprofits. Following Natalie, we'll do a panel style fireside chat with our three panelists to discuss what's working and election year advocacy. Uh, then, of course, we'll do some, uh, we'll do Q&A, take comments from you all, and then we'll have our pop quiz and close out for the afternoon. For our poll question, I want to hear from you all to get a sense of uh, who's on today's webinar. So for today's poll question, we'd like to know what type of tax-exempt organization do you represent? Um, are you with a 501c3 public charity, a 501c3 private foundation, a C4, an affiliated 501c3 or C4? or number five, you don't know, or other, or um, you're an advocate not representing, representing an organization. So take a few seconds to fill out our poll question, just to give Natalie a sense of who's on the call this afternoon. And I will give it about another five seconds before we so it looks like a majority of you are uh, 501c3 public charities, um, and then another 14% of you uh, are unknown or individual advocates. So we've got a pretty good majority there of um, charitable organizations. So without further ado, Natalie, I hope that this helps uh, you tailor your presentation a little bit more. I will turn it over to Natalie Austinport from uh, Boulder Advocacy at Alliance for Justice. Natalie. Thank you so much for that introduction, Vanna. Really appreciate being here with all of you today. Today, as you mentioned, we are going to talk about the election year advocacy rules that apply to different types of nonprofit organizations. But before we do that, I'll give you a little bit more information on the next slide about our Boulder Advocacy Program. Boulder Advocacy, for those who aren't familiar with our organization, is a program of a nonprofit 501c3 called Alliance for Justice. And I'm not sure if you can go ahead and go to the next slide, um, but we should be good to go there. Yep. Um, we work with nonprofits and also with foundations, also with funders, to help them understand what their boundaries are in terms of what they can do as tax exempt organizations. And then we also provide tools and resources to help them build their capacity to engage in advocacy. Just last year, we responded to more than a thousand requests for technical assistance from nonprofit organizations. We trained more than 3,000 um, organizations and foundations on what they can do in the nonprofit advocacy space, which reached more than 8,000 advocates. And so we are here as a resource for you. If you wanna learn more about a training from Boulder Advocacy for your team, or if you want to reach out for free technical assistance or to locate any of our free legal resources, you can visit boulderadvocacy.org or you can email us at advocacy at afj.org. But if we move on to the next slide, let's go ahead and jump in to the main content 
for this particular presentation. And I should issue a quick disclaimer, which is that I am a lawyer, but I am not your lawyer. So we're going to talk generally about the rules today. But in terms of the rules, if we think about different types of tax exempt organizations, there are going to be different advocacy rules that apply for each. So 501c3 public charities, which based on the poll results, it seems like most of you fall into that category. These are really unique organizations because not only are they tax exempt, they don't pay an income tax on the funds that they raise, but they also receive tax deductible contributions. But in exchange for that incredibly favorable tax treatments, there are going to be some limits on the types of advocacy that they can engage in. And those limits come in the area of lobbying and electoral activities. Now, the good news is, is that public charities, type of 501c3, public charities are allowed to lobby as long as they stay within some lobbying limits. Not going to focus too much on that today. But for the purposes of today's discussion, what you need to know is that 501c3 organizations are not permitted to support or oppose candidates for public office, which means that everything a 501c3 does has to be nonpartisan. Now, in terms of these election season advocacy rules, the same rules are going to apply to private foundations, which are another type of 501c3s, although private foundations are effectively prohibited from lobbying and from earmarking grants for lobbying activities. They can engage in nonpartisan electoral activities, again, as long as they don't support or oppose candidates for public office and as long as their activities remain nonpartisan. There are also some special rules that apply to private foundation voter registration drives. Won't touch on that too much today, but if you happen to be a private foundation and you're in the room today, feel free again, reach out to us at advocacy at afj.org for some free technical assistance on that. Now that's the world for 501c3s. 501c4 social welfare organizations, C5s and C6s, which are unions and trade associations, they are also tax exempt, but they don't have tax deductible contributions. So donors don't have that incentive to give like they do for 501c3s. But in exchange for that, they can do unlimited lobbying activities and some partisan electoral work that's designed to support or oppose candidates for public office, as long as it's a secondary activity of that type of the organization and not a primary activity. And then finally, further down the tax exempt org spectrum, you have things like PACs or political organizations, 527s, again, tax exempt. Don't do much lobbying because that's generally a taxable activity for them, but they do exist almost primarily to support or oppose candidates for public office. And so we have a spectrum of different types of organizations, depending on the type of organization that you work for or work with, which again, for most of you, it seems like that's a 501c3 public charity, there are going to be different rules that apply. So if we go to the next slide, we are really going to focus in on those rules for 501c3s. And again, the rule for 501c3s is that we cannot support or oppose candidates for public office including candidates who are not affiliated with a political party. So if at the local level, for example, your city council is a quote unquote nonpartisan race, like it is here in the city of Dallas where I'm located, still can't chime in in terms of who should be elected because even though people aren't running with a D or an R or an I, some other party affiliation next to their name, they are still candidates for public office. Therefore, C3 should not chime in in terms of who should hold those seats. On the next slide, what you will realize is that this is going to apply to candidates who have declared that they are running for office. It also can apply to people with hype around them such that the public is trying to recruit them to run. Again, I'm from Texas, so I'm going to use a local example, but we have two people who have announced that they are running for governor. They are Greg Abbott, who is the incumbent, and Beto O'Rourke, who is challenging him on the Democrat side. These two individuals obviously count. As candidates for public office, there were, therefore our C3 should not support or oppose these individuals, but also people like Matthew McConaughey. At one point in time, there was some hype, there was some buzz around the possibility of whether McConaughey might run for public office, but even though he decided not to, ultimately, still would have been inappropriate for us to try to chime in on whether he would have been an acceptable candidate for governor of Texas. And so again, this is a pretty broad definition of who qualifies as a candidate for public office. On the next slide, you'll find out a little bit more detail about what it means to not support or oppose candidates for public office. And really at this point, I wanna hone in on what's called the facts and circumstances test. 
obviously as a 501c3 it's inappropriate for us to endorse a candidate or to expressly oppose a candidate but the rules really go beyond that type of activity and the rules want us to ensure that everything we do is nonpartisan in nature so how does the irs how does the tax code help you determine whether your activity is nonpartisan well it uses a facts and circumstances test going to give you an example here and then we're going to kind of break it down a little bit but what you'll know is this facts and circumstance really dictates how much risk your organization might incur with a particular communication or activity during an election season so here we have an example it says who's for kids and who's just kidding 85 percent of american voters agree that our political leaders are not doing enough to help solve the problems facing children today if government is not about children then what is it worth make your vote count for kids the question on the table is is this okay for a 501c3 to post this type of communication maybe in the newspaper maybe on its social media its twitter account for example its facebook page its instagram and the answer is it depends it depends on the facts and the circumstances and so for example if this organization has been around for decades everything they do is centered on children making the world a better place for children by improving their health care improving their education systems again this organization has been around for a while so this issue is central to its mission they posted this particular ad in january after several public officials took office and they purchased some clip art on the internet in order to have the graphic at the top and they post this type of message year round regardless of whether there's an election happening or not well given those facts and circumstances this might be a low risk ad for this particular organization but what if you change the facts still post it on their facebook still running the newspaper but in this case you have an organization that's brand new children are not central to their mission they have a much more broad mission to help the community but kids are not really the focus here that's a photo of one of the candidates chins in the eyes of his daughter and there's actually an election coming up because this is posted in october as opposed to january organization has never posted this type of ad before so the first time they're doing it is right before this election and maybe issues related to children are a contentious issue in this particular election well now you have the exact same ad but you have a risky communication based on the facts and the circumstances. And so if we go to the next slide, we'll kind of you know, spread these out a little bit, make these facts and circumstances make more sense. But some good facts for your organization might be not referencing a candidate or an election in your communication, timing a communication according to factors that are unrelated to an election, targeting a specific sector of the community with your communication, for reasons unrelated to an election. Bad facts, on the other hand, would be referring to candidates as candidates, timing your communications to have them motivated by the election, by the poll date, targeting specific sectors of the community based on how you think they might vote in regards to certain types of candidates. The next slide, you have more facts and circumstances that are relevant. Um, so for example, a good fact would be providing information about issues that your organization cares about without mentioning the candidate's position on those issues, also having an organizational history of commenting on those issues versus a bad fact or a bad set of facts comparing a candidate's position to your organization's position. That gets real risky real fast for 501c3s. And of course, emphasizing wedge issues that divide the candidates, especially if you're doing it for the first time. So all those facts and circumstances are going to matter. Let's see how they apply to some real life examples. If you kind of go to the next slide, we'll, we'll start hashing this out a little bit. But let's say that there's an incumbent. So someone who is a sitting policymaker and you want to comment on a policy decision that they make today. Just because it's an election season doesn't mean you can't do that. You just wanna look at the facts and circumstances to try to minimize your risk. And so for example, let's say you wanted to criticize a governor who makes a decision today that you don't agree with as an organization and that's central to your mission you can do that just focus on the official actions only don't refer to the governor as a candidate or reference the fact that they might be up for re-election just talk about them in their official capacity 
time your communication to coincide with that policy action as opposed to the election, have a track record of working on the issue, include criticisms and praises of policymakers who are not up for re-election as well so that there's no implication that you're doing this to try to influence the outcome of an election. Do be aware when you're commenting on contentious issues and of course never criticize personal characteristics because that'll increase your risk level as a 501c3. On the next slide, you'll see another type of activity, which is candidate education. Organizations can educate candidates on where they stand about issues, um, just so that those candidates, if they get elected, have a little bit more information, a little bit more in their arsenal in terms of what they can do on behalf of their communities. But you do, if you wanna do candidate education, have to offer it to all candidates equally. You don't want to offer them information that you don't already have on hand. And so if you get a call from a candidate wanting talking points, wanting data that you don't already have on file, already have publicly available, try not to go out looking for that data because that looks like a candidate contribution, which is obviously problematic for a C3. But again, you can offer information to all candidates. You can provide them with information that's already publicly available but only create new information if your organization has an independent reason to do so other than a request by a candidate. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about voter education. You can do things like candidates debates and forums if you do them in a nonpartisan way. So you've got to make sure you have unbiased questions on a broad range of issues. Got to make sure the audience and the moderator are impartial, that the rules are fair. You have to provide equal opportunity to all candidates, but this can be a 501c3 safe activity, as is the next slide, which talks a little bit about, um, well, let's wait for the next slide. <laughs> I think we're just waiting on the next slide. Voter engagement. Um, again, a C3 safe activity, including voter registration. I did mention private foundations, Real tricky rules when it comes to voter registration, so reach out to us at advocacy at afj.org if you need information about that. But for 501c3 public charities, voter registration and voter engagement are something you can do in a nonpartisan way as long as you follow these tax code rules and remain in compliance with state law. So for example, if you're registering voters, don't reference candidates or political parties at your event. Don't suggest who people should vote for. Make sure your services are available to everyone and that you're targeting sectors of the community, not based on how you think they're gonna vote in regards to candidates, but based on some neutral nonpartisan criteria. And on the next slide, you'll get a little bit more information, but again, voter registration, voter engagement are things you can do. Here's our pop quiz. I won't poll anyone because there's a lot of you in the room. Um, but if you go ahead and hit the space bar three times, what you're going to find out is things like saying vote pro-choice, vote pro-life are going to be red lights. Don't do that if you're a 501c3. Why? Because that issue is so politicized that candidates stand on either side. So you would necessarily be suggesting what types of candidates people should vote for. Also, the IRS has expressly named that particular issue as one that it does not want C3s to chime in on in regards to how people should vote during a candidate election. Something like both the environment could go either way um, because environmental issues become more politicized every day. So you've got to look at the facts and the circumstances versus something like vote, it's easy. That's something a C3 can say. It doesn't take a position on issues, doesn't encourage people to vote for certain parties or political candidates. And so that would be a C3 safe activity in most circumstances once you look at those facts and circumstances. I think on the last slide, um, I'm not actually sure if I have one more slide or not. Um, but what I would just say is, you know, again, feel free to reach out to us. We offer free technical assistance for any nonprofit. I'm hoping someone will drop a link in the chat here in a minute. But do reach out. If you come up with a question next week and you wish you would have asked it, uh, reach out to us. We are here and happy to help. Again, can't be your lawyer, but have people on staff five days a week to help answer your questions for free. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Natalie. I always learn something every time I have a presentation or I hear a presentation from someone over at Boulder Advocacy. You all do such incredible work. Um, and to push back a little bit on Natalie saying, if you have a question, uh, we can answer it in, in a week or two. I want to open it up for a quick question or two to see if folks have questions in the chat. Um, I see a great question from Greg here. Can C3 and C4 organizations work together on voter registration campaigns? 
Yes, that is definitely possible. So the trick there is that if you are going to work in coalition with the C4 as a 501c3, you want to make sure that the entire coalition activities, the joint activities are all done in a nonpartisan way. Um, that could be different organizations, totally separate organizations that, you know, happen to work in coalition together. That would also apply to affiliated organizations because some of us as three C C3s have affiliated C4s. Um, but the long story short is that, yes, you can work together with different types of organizations, but that collective work all has to be nonpartisan. So if, for example, the C4s in the room also are doing partisan activity, so support or opposition of candidates, which they can do some of, that has to be totally separate and apart from any nonpartisan joint work that you might do together. Um, I do recommend for that, and um, I'm not sure if I can drop a chat link or if someone else might find it, but if you just go on Google and you Google Boulder Advocacy, the connection, that is our comprehensive guide to creating and operating C3s C4s and political committees. There's a chapter in there about working together um, and it talks about all sorts of activities that you can do together jointly and describes how you can make sure to keep each of those nonpartisan. Thank you for that Natalie. I've got another quick question that I want to ask before we move on here from Sarah. Um, how do we think about our personal advocacy as leaders versus the organization's advocacy? Sure, very important especially in the election context. You know, the good news is that just because you work for a nonprofit organization, a 501c3, that doesn't mean you give up your right to do your own partisan activities in your own time. The trick is you have to make sure those are truly done on your own time using your own resources. Because what you don't want is a situation where C3 resources are being used to advance some sort of partisan objective. So how can you do that? One, you know, if you want to sign up for that campaign mailing list, go for it use your Gmail account as opposed to your organizational account, right? So use your personal email account. If you want to go to that rally that happens to take place in the middle of the workday, use your PTO time and don't wear your organizational t-shirt to that event so as to not inadvertently tie your organization to that partisan political activity. If you want to go to a fundraiser, fine, do it in your own time, you know, on your, you know, with your own cash, that type of thing. Um, so again, you know, you can do all of these things, partisan things, on your own time, in your own capacity. The real key is not to use any of your organization's resources and for the organization itself not to ratify those acts by effectively paying you to be there. Um, so there are some tricks that you can do for that. We have a fact sheet on that as well. Uh, reach out to us at AFJ.org and we'll send you that fact sheet or you can Google uh, Boulder Advocacy, Individuals Working for C3's Election Season, and I think you'll probably see it, it'll pop up, um, but lots of tips and tricks that, that you as an individual can use to make sure that your personal political activities don't get imputed onto your C3. Great, thank you, Natalie. And we'll, I know that we had a lot of questions in the chat and we'll circle back to the rest of the questions at the end when we do our larger Q&A. So thanks a lot for that, Natalie, for that great presentation. And I also wanna make the audience aware, please pay attention to the chat as we're dropping some of the links that Natalie's mentioning into this chat. They, can, uh, they will be really helpful to you all. Uh, so now I wanna move us forward as we get ready to go into our panel discussion here. But before we do so, I want to ask another quick poll question to help our panelists get a sense of who's on the call. So really quickly, if you all will answer this, is your organization a part of a coalition? Um, yes, you all lead or co-chair the coalition. Uh, yes, you're a member of a coalition, but you uh, are not a leader of that coalition, or no, you don't um, serve as a part of a coalition. If you all will take a second to answer that. All righty, let's see what we have here. Oh, it looks like most of you are in coalition. About 70% of you are in coalitions and another 30% of you are not and 38% uh, of you lead or coach here. So that is great to hear. Um, so let's dive into our panel discussion. We've got, again, a um, great group of panelists here. Yamhi Park, who is with Prosperity Now, Harish Patel from Economic Security for Illinois, and then Sabrina De Santiago, who is with Golden State Opportunity. And I am really excited to speak with these uh, panelists, if they will come on screen and let us just get get underway, we'll dive right into to our panel discussion this afternoon. So I think I'll start with um, my first question here. I'll direct to Harish and Sabrina. I know that you both successfully advocated for EITC expansion in your respective states. 
Um, could you talk a little bit about how your organizations managed to make an impact? What worked for you? What challenges you, you faced along the way and how you overcame those some of those challenges? Uh, and Sabrina, let's start with you. So at GSO, um, we really did three things in terms of our coalition work. And I'm going to be speaking more from the coalition angle because um, I really think that that is a powerful tool for people who are looking to make um, changes in advocacy or changes in power structures. So um, we kept it local. You know, every politician that you're going to talk to, even the leader of a chamber, has a local district and local constituents that they're responsible to. So you need to have people from that district, really. Um, I know that sounds, people think that sometimes politicians don't care um, about who calls them or who writes her, but that is not true. Um, they will notice you if you have constituents as part of your group. Um, we also shared the work. We didn't always, like GSO doesn't have all the expertise in the world, but together with our other co-leads, um, like United Ways of California, Grace and Child Poverty, um, we also get technical advice, and I'll talk about that a little later, but we, um, we just keep bringing in more people to keep expanding our expertise, and that's also a great opportunity to grow. So I don't think you have to know everything. Um, and then we just keep at it. We've got a plan A, a plan B, C, and D. Um, every time someone is like, well, we can't do that. We're like, well, what can you do? Well, what about this? Well, what about that? So we just keep sort of pounding away at folks until there is something, because you know the kinds of offices that want to work with you. You're going to feel that as you're talking to them. It's about finding that um, common ground as you build your relationships. And maybe it's not something that you're trying to push for this cycle or for this season, but it may be something in your future. So it's important to build those relationships. Um, once again, thank you to, for, for making this happen. Thank you for inviting me. I'm Harish Patel. My agenda pronouns are he, him. I'm the director of Economic Security for Illinois. And um, Sabrina made it easy for me. I would absolutely agree with her on all of this, including that all of our work at Economic Security for Illinois happens in coalition as well. Uh, we are a organization that is fighting to create an equitable and inclusive economy uh, in the state. Uh, for some of you who may know this, but state of Illinois, even though it is very progressive in some ways, is actually has one of the most regressive tax code. We have a flat income tax and we're ranked um, about 42nd in how bad we are when it comes to the tax code. So a lot of our work is around undoing some of the historical damage that has been done with a terrible tax code. And the way we do that is through what a lot of you all may know, the earned income tax uh, credit, the child tax credit, and then direct cash investment, uh, which have become a lot more popularized in the past few years. So we work on city, county, and state policies to sort of put direct money into people's pockets and their bank accounts. We also were pretty involved in helping the state write the Illinois Future of Work uh, report to think through the next decade on how we're gonna create equitable jobs uh, for our state that are indirectly, uh, in many ways, tied to our tech code. So that's our work. The two things what worked um, that Sabrina kind of talked about is we uh, had trust in our coalition. Like people really actually show up for each other. Our coalition is 44, 45 members now. It does represent the state. It represents a pretty diverse sort of industries from chamber, small business association, to the funding world, to labor community and advocacy. And that sort of the, the each of the piece of the pie that Sabrina was talking about is accurate. Each one of them come to the table with something to offer and a different audience that they are communicating to. And that was really helpful. And then we had a lot of respect for the balance between the inside and outside game. What I mean by inside and outside game is inside, we do work with C4 organizations strategically. We will work with legislators strategically. As Sabrina mentioned, we do bring our outside people to meetings when we're meeting with the governor's office or the mayor's office or legislators. There are people who are strategically asked to speak because um, a certain, you know, certain people will only, the messenger matters, I guess that's the, the summary of that. And we made sure that any strategic decisions we were making as a coalition had a pretty healthy balance between folks who represent a lot of people on the outside, don't always have access to quote unquote uh, um, electoral power, 
or the governor's office or legislator. And we were listening to people who uh, speak to legislators on a daily or weekly basis. And we wanted to make sure that any long-term or mid-term plans were thoughtful in including those folks. The challenges I already mentioned, we're extremely regressive in our tax code and we are ranked 50th in our fiscal health uh, when it comes to state funds. So we really have to milk uh, the cow in some ways uh, and build a lot of power to get little money sometimes. Thank you both for that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the who, um, because we know that systemic issues can be large, can be complex sometimes, and involve many different levers of government. Um, so my next question for you all is, what levers of government needed to be influenced for your campaigns to be successful? Um, sort of what relationships were necessary for your campaigns to be successful? Harish, I'll start with you on this one. Yeah, so beyond the coalition, I kind of lean into talking about, you know, we, uh, a couple of years ago, we ran this campaign and we didn't win. And part of what we recognized is that we were trying to talk to everyone, create a really bipartisan, we had 78 legislators signed on to our bill that didn't pass. And one of the strategic things that we pivoted on was to focus on one chamber and few people from that chamber that made our issue their number one issue. Instead of being 78 people's non-top three issue, we chose to target this past year, which strategically for us worked really well, was to have champions in one house, either a house or a Senate, and then neutral or semi-positive governor is sort of our what worked for us. For you all, it may be that the governor is really excited about something and the house and the Senate is not, but you're gonna need at least one of them to champ your cause. It allows for opportunities for social media. It allows a hook for the media to pay attention to your cause. But also without that, if you can't get in any of those rooms, it's really hard for them to then bring you to another room where a Senator that might oppose you will at least give you a second or 30 seconds to listen to your issue. So one of that is that you have to, instead of, I think that instead of going for 100 legislators who care about you, finding your revenue chair or your budget chair, if it's an economic issue, to really care about this, or if you don't have that, then a member of the committee from those committees has to care about you and your issue. And then I think it is easy to say, but harder to do, the balance between inside and outside game. Sometimes we can give either one organization because it's say it has money, or one organization that has a lot of access to a certain politician have too much strategic advantage and making decisions, and that usually doesn't end up winning a campaign. The balance between the outside inside game, which I have repeated multiple times, which is a huge lesson for us from the past year, is really important. And a decision being made about how to lobby, who to lobby, who, who to bother, who not to bother, which people are gonna get to speak in front of legislators should be made with sort of, sort thoughtful, equitable uh, perspective on who from the outside with the base and who on the in, inside with access is making those decisions. Uh, that's sort of my levers of government piece. Uh, I already sort of talked about the relationships we had with budgeteers that really helped. Uh, and then every meeting we had somebody from our community that can share how the positive side of this could be impactful for their lives and their families. It sounds weird, maybe like as long as you do it well and you don't tokenize people, it is so grounding. Even the people that you think have already heard your story, right? So we have Senator Durbin who has heard about child tax credit over and over. Few times he needed the opportunity to hear directly from a parent who then he was able to speak to the media and when he was on, on the floor, Senate floor, talk, talked about this story because it was fresh in his mind and he needed a hook. So we're doing these people a favor when I when we center these demands in actual stories. So I, even when it feels awkward or weird or you're not prepped, I highly recommend you find some time to center some of these in some of your community members. And so I would say um, to add a little bit to that, that um, I think some of the, it is about the partnership. So what Harry said, right on point. 
Um, but how do you find the policymakers that are right to partner with? Yes, committee of jurisdiction, that's a fancy term for just saying where your bill is going to go to be heard first, where it starts. Um, one of those, awesome, because then you've got your foot in the door. The committee staff care about it, right? Um, but you can also be somewhere where your impact is going to be, the thing you're asking for the change is going to have a big impact. So like if there's a specific community where um, you know there's a concentrated, like let's say, you know, we were expanding the child tax credit um, or the state child tax credit to something we did this year, right? Reducing the income to zero so that folks um, who are caregivers and don't have income can still access it. We knew that there were pockets in the state where that was going to be a bigger issue, where you had more stay-at-home parents or single parents who couldn't work. And we talked to those folks and they were, they had a stake in the game because they could, we could tell them, well, it's going to bring back this many dollars to your district. It's going to bring back this many dollars to the folks who, um, who vote for you. You know, and you don't always have to be so direct about that. They get it when you say things like, um, what are you bringing back home? Like what, this is a win you can take back to folks. Um, and then I would think this is, at, a lot of times, especially in a state like California, we've got a lot of progressives and we've got a lot of folks who are looking to make a name for themselves. And so to Harisha's point, you really want someone who's going to make this their top priority. Um, and it doesn't hurt to help. It doesn't hurt to get someone who, to help you who is really comfortable in front of a camera, in front of the press. Um, you know, some policymakers are much more in the weeds and some are a little bit more comfortable in front of cameras. The camera folks can really help launch you. You do need the policy folks, but that's a little bit of a second step after you get someone who wants to build buzz around what you do. Thank you both for that. Um, another question that we that we tend to get is when talking about um, state and local advocacy versus federal advocacy. We're seeing a lot of movement at the state level on some issues that are that can be pretty slow to move on the federal level. Um, what types of collaborations are helpful for state and local advocacy to scale into federal advocacy? Um, Sabrina, I'll start with you on this one. Um, I think when you have uh, an organization in your partnership like ESP, who has both local chapters and national work, that is always a great way um, to do it. So we work a lot with uh, United Ways of California, but also with United Way um, of America. So there are folks who are helping us plug into, into the work that's happening national without us having to add to our workload, because I know a lot of us don't have the space to hire more staff to just do something like this. Um, so they'll filter that all for you. And then I want to remind something is that you have something that national groups value. To Harisha's point earlier, it's the stories, it's the people. Without those, you're just talking about facts and figures. But if you can say to somebody, um, you know, the extra $200 that I got for the child tax credit this month, I bought my kids shoes with that. You know, they hadn't had sho new shoes this school year. Or um, I took my kids to the dentist. We hadn't, had, we hadn't been able to do that. When you can share that kind of impact, people are going to want to join your fight. And um, so really, I think for the federal outreach, if you have those connections, if you have um, those stories, that is also a really great way to plug in to national work. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, I mean, the only thing to add to what Sabrina is saying is for us, um, we did, you know, it, it's, we might, in some ways care about if a person is getting federal money or state money or city money or county money but the most of the time the person receiving that money thinks about it as money in my pocket and we sometimes get so caught up in like is this going to be good for the state person or county most of the time these stories matter to every politician in some ways, regardless of um, how we may want to frame federal versus state. And so Sabrina is right that like most federal orgs, when they want to talk to or talk about our state are going to have to come to us because we have access to people whose stories matter. We have access to not only stories, but people who can, uh, who understand the issue just enough 
where they can uh, be the good hook for then us to do the facts and figures later. Um, so the, the, the Senator Durbin example is a very uh, good example for us strategically, Illinois matters because he's number two leadership position. So a lot of federal orgs will reach out to us. In return, we wanna make sure that our people are being respected. And whenever there is federal funding coming to them that they're sharing that, and whenever our people are spending time to prep or travel, that they get financially the money that they deserve for their time, just like all of us get paid to do our jobs, our community members also deserve that pay. So we sort of create that conditions and we sort of set that up um, to make sure that there is sort of shared revenue uh, coming if we're gonna do federal work. And then also we made sure that our coalition members are open to and interested in whatever federal partnership because some federal organizations are not very good at partnering and there are certain uh, groups that are and coalitions that are. And then also the last strategic decision that we had to make was we know that certain times federally there is a op opportunity that we're not going to have at the state or vice versa. So for us, we pushed the IT inclusion, which is uh, undocumented folks who pay uh, taxes through using a different code than a social security number, a uh, nine digit number. We knew that it's gonna be extremely hard to win that on a federal level. So on a state, we put a lot of efforts in that inclusion campaign. But strategically, we didn't run our own Illinois Child Tax Credit campaign because we thought that was, at the time, we thought that the federal child tax credit strategically is a lot more money for our people. So we're gonna spend a lot of time fighting for that. So these are sort of decisions that you can make, I obviously, uh, analyzing a power dynamics of what's happening at state versus federal and also that IT inclusion in 10 15 states now next couple of years will hopefully create the conditions for a federal campaign so we're sort of thinking that through you know a three to five year plan as well um, that's sort of how we decide at least make on when to do state when to do federal work I wanted to shift a little bit and talk a, about community I know that you both have mentioned storytelling and involving um, you know, impacted families. And we've got a whole webinar dedicated to this next week, but I wanted to quickly throw this in here just to get your perspective on it. One of the challenges that nonprofits face, um, or any advocate really, if we're being honest, is getting community involved in policy advocacy efforts for whatever reason. Um, how were you all able to get community members involved in your advocacy efforts? Uh, Harish, I'll start with you here. Yeah, I think you're right that we did mention a few times community, and I think we might have already, I'm going to repeat some of the stuff I've said. One, uh, accessibility was important. Um, we have folks who speak a uh, different language or learn differently, some through video, some prefer in person. So during code, we have to sort of work through what makes most sense. Surprising for us, or maybe not surprising for you all, a lot of the parents that we work with actually prefer uh, online engagement because they don't want to travel to the capital or they don't want to actually like we had more engagement uh, because people were uh, using you know their phones from work or in their car or and and that is one uh, second we do things for people so it's not a transaction that feels uncomfortable for them and or um, uh, they know they're valued beyond this one time that they're gonna speak for us right so when we have events they're invited, their kids are invited. We provide childcare for the kids at the event thoughtfully. And if we know certain community members are gonna be there or speaking, we have translation, bilingual, or trilingual, depending on who is gonna be in the room. And then we do provide uh, financial support, uh, both for the time that takes to prep and travel to something. So Springfield, which is our capital, like all of that, we will provide them a financial um, sort of we'll talk through what is their need. Sometimes they need money for childcare, sometimes they just need money for transportation. We sort of provided a little checklist for us to internally think through how much resource is important for them to be able to do this thing that we think is extremely important and valuable. Um, I'll, I'll stop there because I'm, I don't, I, I'm sure Sabrina has probably a few more to add. No, I mean, I think you covered that really well. Um, I think the one part I would emphasize is the going back to people when it's not just about the ask. Um, making, centering your work on the people who are most impacted. If you do that on a regular basis, you're going to be including people um, all the time. It's just going to be what you do. Um, and I think the other pieces are, right, trusted messengers who already have good relationships. 
Um, you know, we work with a lot of groups that do wraparound services and already are providing like uh, how to apply for different federal benefits work. So it's, they already have some of those relationships and they are great messengers to say, hey, could we bring you in to having your voice heard? Can we help you um, in an effort to, to get more for this program? Um, and then good collateral, it doesn't hurt. Uh, people like to have things that they can look at and either, you know, if it's your um, posts on social media or if, it's, if you're in person and you're doing handouts, like something that's easy to understand that connects people back to you and to your organization so that you can fold them in even if they're not ready when you first caught them. Um, so those are the things I'd add. A great point. And Yemi, I'll bring you into the conversation. We have not heard from you on the panel. Yeah, um, no, I just want to um, echo everything that Harish and Sabrina have been saying and everything that they've been saying uh, just makes me think about this example um, um, from our organization, um, a campaign that we did called Build Back for Justice. And um, you know that really key element of partnerships and relationship building, but like meaningful relationship building. Um, so you know we had a staff um, um, at Prosperity Now who had an existing relationship with Just Harvest, um, an organization that um, has connections to clients, um, and they sort of reached out to us and were like, you know, can we share storytellers who want to talk about the CTC and how they how it helped them and um, really giving them a national um, outlet to um, take their first, first step towards advocacy. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to just underscore everything that Harish and Sabrina have been saying about, you know, it really is about the partnerships, the relationship building and um, being really intentional and meaningful about that. Awesome, and I'm gonna stay there because I'm gonna call on you again here, Yemi. Um, but we, we all know that there's a lot going on in the world. Um, I've heard some people even describe like this policy landscape as whack-a-mole, where there's just so many issues to address at once. Once you whack one mole, another one's coming up. Um, but with so much noise in the world, how do you increase campaign visibility when legislators are just dealing with so many competing asks at the same time? And Amy, I'll kick this one over to you to start us off. Sure. Um, so first, I don't want to minimize the reality of the, the competing asks because that is um, a very real thing that as advocates, we really all deal with. So I can get at the how, how we do this in a little bit, but I also you know, sort of wanna challenge this notion that we have to work within the structure of competing asks and com competition within movements, because um, I really believe that that's fundamentally a fallacy of white supremacy and how some people in power want to pit policies or issues against each other or believe, make us believe that we have to choose one over the other to get anything done. Um, but this kind of scarcity mindset really allows systems of oppression to thrive. Um, and you know, that's those were a lot of the conversations that you know our organization was having as we launched this Build Back for Justice campaign to counter this kind of narrative, specifically with the child tax credit and affordable housing. Um, and that campaign was really a response to you know the stalled and restarted Build Back. Um, better act. Um, but, you know, we essentially created this rallying cry um, via, via this campaign, you know, saying that we need both both and more in order to truly build back for justice and trying to debunk this scarcity mindset because the people who are struggling to put food on the table are the same people who are struggling to take care of their kids. They're the same people who need a place to live. They're the same people that are impacted by the lack of access to health care by racist systems on and on. So um, we really wanted to create this campaign, you know, so many different organizations could plug in their solutions. Um, you know, our organization was just amplifying the CTC and housing because those were the policies that we had expertise in and we were actively pushing, uh, but we wanted to really open the door for more people to participate in this kind of campaign. Um, and then sort of going back to partnerships, you know, there's that strength in numbers, the importance of a united coalition, um, when I think about advancing issues or policies, I think about how to engage people through sort of multiple entry points um, and how partnerships are really key to this and at the heart of like an intersectional approach to advocacy, because at the core, it's really about a unified effort to make sure everyone's included um, and nobody's really left behind. Um, 
so that was a lot of sort of intro, but um, I would I did say that I would sort of talk about how, the how um, to really get back to your question in the context of all, all of this. But so how like and trying to answer the question of how do you talk about issues that unify many different issue areas and ensure that people see themselves um, reflected. Um, and, um, you know, in my experience, um, you do that by leading with shared values. So um, in the next slide. Um, you know what, and 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 I'll sort of um, step back and 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 think about you know and sort of define core values. Um, but what I mean when I say core values, it's it's those deeply held beliefs that drive people's actions and attitudes. Um, and the priority placed in that can change on you know the current circumstance, or it can vary on who you're talking to and and the issue that you're talking about. Um, but I wanted to um, sort of engage our audience and um, ask them the question, um, you know, like, if you had to select one response from below, why do you advocate for racial economic justice? And this obviously is not a extensive list. Um, but, you know, doing some preliminary research and speaking to some former colleagues who do opinion and message research. Um, I've sort of pulled together this quick list um, when it comes to racial equity and economic justice. But um, if folks are interested, please, um, you know, feel free to answer. Um, and I, I'll also be curious to hear from my fellow panelists um, um, what their answer would be. I'd say for me, it's probably equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. I am kind of sappy in that I really think that this country can be really great if we make the commitment to to do the things we've actually said we've done or that we're going to do. Um, and so for me, it's equal opportunity. Thank you for sharing that. What about you, Harish? Um, yeah, you know, I was thinking about like, well, our name is economic security, so I should pick financial security. But um, equity has sort of become a sense like anything from an equity lens feels like a shared value for us uh, and that's how we see not just funding from the government to our people but even like funding from funders to nonprofits or us nonprofits mm -hmm. to community members like there we are thinking about an equity based lens um, when it comes to most of our sort of why we do racial economic justice work yeah um yeah and you know this list definitely isn't comprehensive i think there is a, a need for more specific op opinion and message research testing such as, especially in this field and um i think it should be like a field coalition effort so maybe that's something that we can you know collectively explore um but on the next slide um i want to just sort of um oh and next slide we can go to the next slide um this triangle sort of illustrate how I think about, um, you know, how to communicate with shared values. So the bottom are the solutions, um, legislation or policy that, you know, tackle an issue. The middle are um, the issues that, you know, folks engage in advocacy around. Um, and then the top is that sort of like top level values um, that drive the issue advocacy and solutions that we propose that really unify and ground how we communicate effectively. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that. And I'll see if Harish or Sabrina, Harish, if you had a follow-up, you want to yeah, add I mean, anything? I mean, I was just thinking about how do you sort of break through the, the cycle of, I mean, something that came up for us is many of our coalition members fight for a whole human being. And that whole human being needs more than just whatever issue that I think is the most important because of our mission statement. And recognizing and having really honest conversation among uh, coalition members was an important, uh, as they're onboarding to working with us, those are important uh, questions. And thinking about having um, very sort of honest tool creation before you have that emergency is really important for us. So for us, we set up if this comes down to picking two things that we can get into our budget last minute 
how are we going to think through if we give up our issue or not, right? And uh, a child tax credit advocates right now are going through that stage of thinking, right, in the federal level. If our people don't get child tax credit, what else can they get that feels close to a child tax credit, right? So that's one, and it's important, and it's really sometimes can get really hard for especially members in our coalition that have more than one campaign that they're fighting for. Um, but it has worked for us because there's been a lot of trust outside of just going to those meetings. We've showed up for each other in other places. And so when that moment happens, people know to call uh, or have meetings that are separately from that coalition meeting. So that's one. The, the piece around what you're seeing the image of is that um, beyond uh, consistent engagement, which obviously a lot of you probably have, are aware of and know what to do with, we benefited really a lot from having a direct conversation and feedback from our champions. Like this palm card that you see uh, became a center point, which we, I had not thought would be that important. But we were shocked that uh, our Senate champion was like, look, I am representing a, a district where there's an assumption by my, a lot of my colleagues that most of the money goes into my district. That's why I care. I want to show them that there is actually a lot of money from earned income tax credit and child tax credit going into their districts. I know there is. They don't know that. Can you make district by district palm cards? And we were shocked. We saw like the day of vote of many of the legislators comparing their palm cards to each other, basing their vote on if they support it based on this palm card that we had provided to them. And this is sort of like, I wouldn't care because that's not how I would think about legislation. But the, the, the champion um, in the Senate told us, like, this is how he thinks we'll be able to cultivate, especially districts where there are not a lot of immigrants and Latinos uh, from his district, where um, he could convert some of the downstate or sort of moderate Dems into supporting this because they'll see the numbers and the money will uh, bring them to support it. This is one example. I think it's important to have constant engagement with your champions and listen to the tools that they think that we should provide, even when they didn't make sense to us. Uh, we went with this and it did become a, a really important tool for us. To that, I'd add a little bit about, um, I really love saying things in threes, so focus. Um, we know we didn't have 18 asks. We hone in on two or three each year, and we have the list of 18, but then once we get those two or three, we shift to the next one, next ones. Um, we stay local. We stay really grounded in what it means to people today in their pocketbooks. A lot of folks, you know, um, you hear the joke about like, you know, it's a banana, Michael. How much could it cost? Seven dollars. But like, there was a lot of people who don't have the experience of having to be like, I think I'm gonna let that bill ride for like two weeks and hope they don't charge me extra. Um, like they just, they think that that is a very small subsection of the world and it's really so many people who are having to, to do that kind of math in their lives. And so reminding people that it's not just the, maybe the typical characters that they might think are experiencing poverty that way, that it's so much more. Um, and then we're a good ally. We don't go into meetings, you know, say thinking like, oh, we shouldn't like and let too many people know that we're going to be meeting with this person because everyone's going to want to come in. Everyone's going to talk about their thing. We're just like, yeah, everyone is going to come in. And yes, everyone's going to talk about their thing. But so long as at the end, we're all like, this is the one thing we're asking for for this meeting. We're OK with that. And it's really helped us because sometimes we haven't had some connections with different offices or with different um organizations and our partners have been the people who do the introduction. So we really believe in, in sharing the wealth of, of being a good ally. And I am so enjoying this conversation and unfortunately we've got to wrap it up and open up for Q and A, but I want to ask one more question. I had two more panel questions, but I'm just going to do one. And I would ask the audience, if you all have questions for our panelists to go ahead and start uh, putting them in the questions box, number one, but two, also stick around because after Q&A, we're going to have a pop quiz where, again, we'll award a prize to one of you. Um, and then I'll encourage you all to keep tweeting. I hope that you have heard some good nuggets on today's webinar. But final panel question for, from me, excuse me, 
Um, if you all can answer it quickly, my panelists, um, another challenge that nonprofit advocates um, sometimes struggle with is seeing everyday issues in their community, um, you know, working with clients every day, seeing the issues, um, and also having the data readily available, but not really knowing where to turn in terms of a policy solution. Um, how do you go from issue identification to policy solution? Um, and Yumi, I think I'll start with you on this one. Sure. Um, so I really come at this question from a communications and messaging perspective um, with my background. So, you know, how do you effectively talk about the issue and advocate for your solution? Um, and when it comes to communicating on issue advocacy, it's really important that, you know, whoever it is that you're trying to influence knows why you stand for a certain issue um, along with how you're going to tackle it. Um, so I sort of think about it as like, what is the issue? Um, I think about it as answering the why, which is the value that we talked about, um, that underlying value, um, and the what, you know, um, is the issue, and how is the solution, um, the policy um, of your advocacy. Um, and as Sabrina had um, mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of effective communicators, they really, they don't engage in a battle of facts. They articulate the values that resonate and connect with their audiences, and then they use the facts to support, the data points to support. Um, and that's because even if, you know, who, who you're trying to influence, they don't agree with the solution, they can find agreement with the underlying value. And this can be a gateway to eventually moving people along and persuading people to eventually get on board with your solution. Um, and, you know, doing that sort of like values led messaging work, um, it, you know, having that as the basis of your campaign, it really helps connect support for a broad range of issues. So for example, if you value fair treatment, that can translate to, you know, support a policy solution like baby bonds to help bridge the racial wealth gap um, and get fair opportunity to build wealth, have people, you know, be able to build wealth, um, while also translating to support of something like Title IX to help people of all genders to be treated fairly. It really helps to connect the issues. Um, and this is sort of a tool um, that, I you know use to um, develop some develop messages around campaigns. So vision is sort of you know the world that we want. The problem and impact is defining the problem that we're trying to solve for and defining who is being impacted. And many different orga many organizations are really good at that at that part of of creating messages about problem and impact. Um, solution you know is the policy solution that you're talking about. And then the core message is your north star message and the message that. Um, you will always come come back to when it comes to you know how you talk about the issue um, advocacy that you're trying to talk about. And Sabrina, I'll take final thoughts from you here on issue identification or excuse me, policy solution. Yeah, I mean we got help. Like I said, it's all about the coalition work and and being a good ally. So. Um, we have a great partner in the California Policy and Budget Center, who uh, they're non they're nonpartisan, and um, but they are great with facts, and they really um, look at the budget as a values document, and um, with that we can we always have a lot of data, honestly, um, and those numbers are great because we wouldn't have the capacity to get them, so I. I would encourage people to look for those kinds of groups. They always have good information and they're always willing to, to be supportive of all the work. Yeah, and I think the only thing I wanna to add to what Sabrina is saying on this is that if there is one place, I feel like national orgs can be a good partner is this place, right? Because they don't need to be going to local. They have a lot more professional help to parse through data and do policy analysis and so I feel like when it comes to kind of the step right before you take it to the community and organization, that policy analysis, the numbers, the data, the zip code based data, a lot of national partners actually have that. And they have way too many people working on that all the time. So I would, when I, when I think about it, that's like the one place um, I like to go for national partnerships. And then the other piece, I mean, I put, it does, like if you don't like meetings, it's going to be hard to work in this world. Um, you just have to have lots of meetings with strategic minded people, faith based, you know, labor. And that like uh, process of if I want to build 
decision made in January, this summer is when I'm starting to have one-on-one -on -one conversations all through the summer. By end of summer, I'm working with our partners to come up with, here is a generic example of a solution that we want. And then it takes about a month or two to have that policy analysis done before it actually becomes a bill language by December. Then we introduce something in January, right? So there's about six to nine months of work that happens at least for our coalition, which just requires a lot of meetings um and trust building over time so i'm you know it's it's been awesome for us to be able to get to know people and leadership of different organization and community as human beings who also come to this work because they're so excited and passionate about the thing that brought them and finding out that thing in connection to the work we're doing has been um has been super important Great, thank you all for that great discussion. I could have listened to this discussion for a lot longer, but unfortunately I want to hear from our audience and see what questions they have. So I'm gonna turn over, turn it over and look into our questions box to start to ask some questions here. And I think um, while I give you three panelists a moment to breathe and to grab a, a, a bit of water, I'm gonna bring Natalie back into the conversation for a question for, for her that came up earlier. Um, one specifically about housing, Natalie. Um, someone says, I work for a nonprofit that focuses on affordable housing. Um, can we promote a housing initiative? That was the question. I don't have any more than that, but if you can answer that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what you know the housing initiative is, but assuming it's nonpartisan, in other words, it's not designed to get certain types of candidates elected to party, you know, to public office, then this is probably something that your 501c3 public charity can do, assuming it's germane with its mission. Um, you know, I think what would be implicated potentially there is if that initiative involves some sort of legislative ask, whether that's through a local legislature like your city council or your state legislature, for example, or maybe even a federal. Uh, you know, members of Congress, that type of thing. If you are directly communicating with those legislators to ask them to support or oppose a bill, for example, um, or maybe you're encouraging the public to reach out to their legislators in support or opposition of legislation, that legislative advocacy that you might do, um, there's the potential that, you know, depending on how your organization measures its lobbying limits, that that would qualify as a lobbying activity because it's legislative in nature. Um, but again, the good news is, is that that is something that you can do as a 501c3 public charity as long as you stay within your lobbying limits and are tracking that appropriately. Um, now, I will say, too, that if the initiative happens to be an initiative on the ballot, um, so maybe a ballot initiative, right, as opposed to a legislative initiative that would go through a state legislature, um, that is something you can do as a nonprofit as well as a public charity. Ballot measure advocacy generally qualifies as lobbying because in that instance, the public is the legislature because the public decides whether the measure passes or whether the measure fails. And if it passes, it becomes law in that jurisdiction. Um, and so again, ballot measure advocacy is something you can do as a 501c3 public charity. It will count as lobbying, so it needs to count against your lobbying limits. Um, you also want to make sure that ballot measure advocacy is done in a nonpartisan way. So keep your ballot measure advocacy focused on the initiative, on the bond measure, on the constitutional amendment, on the ballot measure, and not on the candidates who happen to sit on that ballot. You know, don't compare the candidate's position to your position on the measure, that type of thing. Um, but again, if you kind of follow those guardrails and remember those facts and circumstances, you could do work around an initiative of that type. Great, and I also want to remind folks to please feel free to uh, pose questions for our panelists in the chat as well. But I'm circling back to another question that came up earlier uh, for you, Natalie, and I think you kind of touched on it, but someone was asking it specifically about messages on your social media. And I'll, and, you know, in answering that, but also seeing if Boulder Advocacy has resources specifically around social media usage for nonprofit staff. We do. We actually just came out with a brand new digital advocacy guide earlier this year. Um, so after I finish talking, I will, I will drop the link um, and hopefully share it out with folks. But yeah, I mean, basic rule, all the rules that apply to your advocacy, you know, if your verbal advocacy, your written advocacy are also going to apply to your social media advocacy. Um, so especially during these election times, be careful what you tweet, be careful what you retweet, make sure you're not retweeting any sort of partisan communication, make sure you're not retweeting messages post by, posted by candidate campaigns, for example. 
um, because that could jeopardize your tax exempt status as a 501c3. Um, but yeah, lots of resources on digital social media advocacy. But again, the general rule is that the rules are the same, even if you're online. And so something as simple as a like or a retweet could potentially cause you problems if you're liking or retweeting something that would qualify as partisan or support the opposition of a candidate. Thanks for that. And I wanted to bring our uh, panel, to, or excuse me, our panelists back into the conversation here. I know that we've been talking about election year um, advocacy. For you all, how can direct service providers and coalitions engage in an election year? I know that Natalie talked about sort of what's permissible, but in terms of um, you know, practical ways that nonprofits can get involved in an election year. So I think that you actually don't do too many things that are different, right? Because um, to Natalie's point earlier, you are setting yourself up to have talked about issues in a different way. But also, if you're only reaching out to candidates or to people during an election cycle, they're going to see you as a transactional relationship. And they're going to come to you with asks around the election cycle. But when you need them is often the off year when you can make those wins happen. Um, so we try to keep a very steady drumbeat of what we're doing. But what we might do a little bit more of in the in the election year is recognize our champions, recognize the people who have done good work with, um, you know, helping them raise their profile, not necessarily um, around the election, but around the issue, right? How much have they fought for this? How much have they um, pushed for and celebrating the wins? Yeah, the other thing that we did <clears throat> is, yeah, as Ms. Sabrina mentioned, we do thank people who work alongside us um, with or without a billing election year. So then we follow Natalie's rules around doing the same thing that we have done last year and we strategically make sure to do it in not election, not election year, so then we can do it in election year because we have shown that we do it every year. Uh, that's one um, suggestion we got earlier on um, for from our lawyers. And then the second one that uh, could be helpful is trying to figure out a, a lot of direct service organizations uh, tend to do much better outreach to people, and so we make sure to give them the tools that they need one pagers and flyers and that sort of thing that ties to our issue and that could be done with you know with election in mind and typically even if you are not giving a legislator credit when they're invited because there's an outreach event or a community event even if they don't show up they remember that and they bring it up uh, when we have a meeting with them afterwards many community organizations um, we work with they don't always do policy work, but once we pass the bill or pass the law, they're the folks who are gonna translate that into real experiences. And those are another tie or hook for that legislator to come and speak or find a way to engage with that community. So that's the other uh, tool possibly to make sure that you are allowed to, allowing your champs to really get the credit that they deserve for carrying a tough bill for you. And I have a, a follow-up question to that. I'm seeing in the chat, I was responding to you, Austin, but I figured I would just read your question and maybe get some clarification there. But it says, my organization do doesn't have much of a history of advocating regarding elections, and we have elections this year, next year, and the year after. What options might we, might we have? And Austin, I was getting ready to respond and ask what you mean by options specifically. Um, but if a panelist wants to wants to take this question, I can just say from a rules-based perspective, you have a lot of options. Um, I would recommend if you just Google this resource or I'll try to drop it in the chat, but we have a resource called The Rules of the Game, a guide to election-related uh, election activities for 501c3 organizations. I'll hold up a copy. It kind of looks like this, but you can download a free copy. Um, tons of different nonpartisan advocacy activities that you can engage in in an election year. Obviously that timing and you know whether you're bringing up an issue for the first time is relevant in that facts and circumstances analysis that we talked about earlier. Um, but you know that's really going to be most key when we're talking about you raising issues, you raising your organizational position on issues and comparing that to an election right before an election happens. 
and that but that's not to say that there aren't other activities that you can do right so you know if you wanted to do kind of a very you know general get out the vote campaign to remind people that it's important to raise their voices and to have a say in the government that serves them you know that's the type of thing that you could potentially do in a nonpartisan way um, but again this guide the rules of the game a guide to election related activities for 501c3s walks you through several different types of activities and how to keep them nonpartisan. So I would recommend starting there. And then if you have any more questions, uh, reach out to our technical assistance hotline. Perfect, thank you for that, Natalie. And I think that answered it. He was asking about to advocate to advocate at all during these years. A quick follow-up, um, and this will be our last question. I'm gonna announce our winners in just a second, but um, question from Molly. When Natalie speaks about being cautious about what you'd like and retweet on social media, is that mainly for the nonprofit itself or us as individuals on our personal social media? Mainly for the nonprofit itself, unless your personal social media is set up as an extension of your nonprofit. So for example, I've got Natalie AFJ as a Twitter handle, which is me as a representative of my organization. I would wanna be more careful there. Um, but you know, my personal Twitter account, Notes by Natalie, um, free for all right <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna see the real me on that one but usually i'm gonna post my partisan stuff after um you know the work day closes so that's when that'll happen but yeah we're really talking about you know things that are said on behalf of your organization using your organization's resources awesome thank you natalie thank you yum he sabrina harish for a great um presentation a great webinar this afternoon i hope that our audience enjoyed it um, and thank you for the thoughtful questions and the comments that we've got in the in the comment box here. So I want to move us along to um, do a pop quiz question. But before I do that, I want to announce our social media winner. Let me find it really quickly. Um, Twitter handle less than, mo than malls. I think that is how to pronounce it. I don't know if that's you, Molly, but uh, less at less than three malls is the Twitter handle. Um, if that is your Twitter handle, please um, type your email address maybe send it to us privately in the chat if you can, or I think we may be able to get your email address um, out of our registration. But thank you, you are today's Twitter social media winner. We'll send you a small prize from Prosperity Now. Thanks for engaging with us on Twitter. And a reminder to the rest of you to please uh, tweet on uh, future Camp Prosperity webinars. You may win a prize. So I want to now, um, <clears throat> I want to now ask our pop quiz question. Um, and again, the first person to type the answer into the questions box will win a small prize from Prosperity Now. But today's pop quiz question, uh, earlier in the webinar, Natalie referenced, uh, referred to good facts and bad facts. If your and my question is, if your fact doesn't reference a candidate or an, or an election, is it a good fact or a bad fact? I'll ask it again because I kind of stumbled over that. Um, Natalie referred to good facts and bad facts. If your fact does, does not reference a candidate or an election, is it considered a good fact or a bad fact? Whoa, you all are very, very fast. Let me see. Austin, you are our winner. Austin Rojas, I think that's how you how I would pronounce your last name. You are our winner. If you would please send us your email address in the chat, we will send you out a small prize from Prosperity Now. Good job, everyone, taking some notes there. Um, so I'm gonna wrap us up really quickly with some um, some next steps and such. I do want to share the contact information for our wonderful, wonderful speakers today. They shared some really great information that I hope you found helpful. Um, I'll give you all a second to screenshot this, uh, this screen. Uh, please feel free to reach back out to them. I know that we've dropped um, a lot of great information in the, in the chat for you all, but if you have follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to them via email. Next, I want to talk next steps. Again, uh, we uh, would, ask that you all please complete uh, the follow-up survey to this webinar. Um, we've done Camp Prosperity for five years in a row now, and the only way that we've been able to improve every year um, and make sure that this series is helpful for you all is through your feedback. So please complete the follow-up survey. Just a reminder that we'll draw a name randomly for folks who have completed the survey. Um, and if we draw your name, you'll win a prize from Prosperity Now. So please um, use that incentive or just the incentive to help us out by completing the survey and do that. Um, also want to remind you to mark your calendar for our next Camp Prosperity session, which will take place next week, a week from today on July 19th. Um, the title is Permission to Engage, Equipping Ambassadors to Advocate for Change. As I mentioned earlier, how do you engage the board? How do you engage uh, clients if you're a direct service provider? 
how do you engage those folks uh, better in your advocacy efforts? So that's what we'll talk about next week. I hope you all can join us. And then lastly, uh, Prosperity Now's flagship conference is coming up. It is taking place uh, from September 19th through the 21st in Atlanta, Georgia, um, our Prosperity Summit. If you all have not already registered, you'll uh, find a link to it in the chat. Please do so today and join other advocates from across the country at our conference and see my face and the face of all of our, my Prosperity Now colleagues. A um, couple other things here. I want to invite you all to join our Prosperity Now Advocacy Center. This is our online advocacy center. It's absolutely free to advocates. It's a place where you all can go and engage your legislators on the local level, on the state level, on the federal level. Go. Uh, you can go in and email them. You can call them. You can tweet at them. You can schedule a meeting with them through their scheduler in our online advocacy center. Uh, you can sign on to petitions that will be sent to legislators. You can do all of those things for absolutely free. Uh, you would just need to go in and register. We dropped the link in the chat for you. Register um, and start taking action today. We've talked about a lot of ways that your organization can engage, can start to become more active in advocacy, and this is just a quick and easy way for you all to get involved. So please uh, join our online advocacy center if you have not done so. And then lastly, I want to invite you all to join our Prosperity Now networks. Um, last but uh, certainly not least, join a Prosperity Network that is of interest to you. You can see the four different networks there, our Affordable Housing Network, our Campaign for Every Kid's Future Network, which really focuses on two-generation policies, um, our Financial Security Network, and then our Taxpayer Opportunity Network. Um, several of these networks have ongoing virtual conversations or webinars and listservs. Um, now that we're mostly virtual, look out for additional virtual conversations from these networks, but they're just really great opportunities for you all to engage more, to connect with your peers across the country who are doing work um, in these respective areas. So there's a link in the chat for you to get involved and for, uh, for you to join our network. Um, so please do that today. And that is all. I want to thank you all for joining us for our first Camp Prosperity session of 2022. I hope that you all enjoyed it. Um, and it, if you could go back, we've got a question in the chat box, Olivia, if you'll go back to the slide with the contact information, I want to uh, make sure we uh, make sure folks have contact information for our speakers. We'll do that here, Lily. Hopefully you can see that. But thank you all for joining. I hope you've enjoyed session one and you will join us for the remaining two sh sessions. Please continue to engage with us on sh social media. If you have additional questions for Prosperity Now, for our speakers, uh, we've got their Twitter Twitter handles on our um, on our social media page, but we encourage you all to continue to engage. So with that, have a great rest of your Tuesday, and we will see you all back here on next Tuesday, July 19th. Thank you.